Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Juma Iraqi. Today's guest is uh, Joseph Agu. Hi Joseph, how are you doing today? Hi Juma, yeah, I'm great, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on the, the podcast. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you for taking the time to do the podcast. And today we're going to talk about carbohydrate periodization. Uh, before we start, I just want to mention that this podcast will be available on YouTube in video format, but if you prefer, prefer to listen to it, uh, you can also check it out on iTunes as well. So, uh, Joseph, uh, before we start with the questions, uh, wow, you look exactly like uh, Johnny Depp, like a lot of people say. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I haven't got the glasses on today. But, um... Yeah. Not today. Okay. I, I, I suppose that's a compliment, isn't it? So yeah, I'll take that one, Gina. Yeah, J Johnny Depp is a, a <laughs> handsome guy, so I would take that as a compliment. Cool. Yeah. 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 Okay, could you give us a short introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, let's start with the, the education. So I graduated from the, the University of Chester in 2010 with a, a degree in Sport and Exercise Sciences. Then I followed that up a year later with a master's degree in sports nutrition. Um, so I graduated with that, I think around 2011. And then between then and 2013, I focused on my consultancy business, which was originally out of josephagu.com. So working with pretty much everyone, really, from your average gym goer right through to elite athletes, um, particularly in athletics. And then in so late 2013, um, I got a job at the, the English Institute of Sport, the IS, uh, working with British Athletics, um, which was which was great. You get a chance to work with many of the, the Britain's best track and field athletes is a, yeah, a, a huge privilege and some of them have gone on to, to medal in, in the, the recent Olympics, so, uh, which, which is good to see. And then I finished there about a year ago, uh, probably maybe close to 18 months actually, and since then I've been focusing on my consultancy business again and, and still working with a handful of elite athletes and, and back to working with um, these sort of average gym goers and um, people seeking improved body composition etc and yeah so my new website now is elitenutritioncoaching.com so that's the, the sort of rebrand and it's given me the ability to then to take on take on more people um, because of the because of the branding, so at the minute there's just me and uh, an SNC coach, uh, Dr. Michael Johnston. He's uh, he's the SNC coach, at British Athletics. So um, yeah, I did the nutrition, uses the training, so it works it works pretty well. Yeah, and that's pretty much where we're at at the minute. Excellent. Have you um, have you ever competed in any sports yourself? Um, I did. Um, I played football like like anyone in England when I was when I was younger. Um, did a little bit of athletics, mainly at school, then uh, kickboxing, so I've got a, a black belt in, in kickboxing, which I got I think when I was about 18. Mm -hmm. I did taekwondo before that, so there's a, a sort of preference for martial arts there. Um, a little bit of boxing as well, but yeah, I've done no sort of formal sort of bodybuilding. I did a lot of competing with, with kickboxing and won some, um, won some trophies with that as well, so yeah, but that's pretty much it. Excellent. Okay, so um, let's dive into the questions. Today's uh, topic, like I said, is um, uh, carbohydrate periodization. So um, my impression is that a lot of people misunderstand <coughs> the, um, the carbohydrate requirements for, uh, for athletes. Um, what, are you, what do you feel are the most common misconceptions about uh, carbohydrates to, for athletes? Um. I think one of the primary ones is that I think both in the media and sort of a sort of general education is that athletes of, of any kind need a need a ton of carbohydrate daily and I think the the sort of um, these recommendations are changing now in the literature but a lot of people are still teaching the sort of seven to ten grams per kilo for any endurance athlete and five to seven grams per kilo of carbohydrate for strength athletes which in many instances is is probably too much and it'll probably be a hindrance in terms of body composition. Mm -hmm. um, even if you look at, say, a, a runner doing 70 miles per week, for instance, that would probably be about an extra 7,000 calories, which would equate to about less than 4 grams 
per kilo extra that they need. So, um, in, based on the, the endurance athletes in British athletics, I'd say most consume between around four to eight grams per kilo. So eight being the sort of guys like Mo Farah and um, the lower levels being mainly sort of potentially middle distance runners. Um, yeah, so it's, I think what what is seen um, to be consumed in, in reality is a sort of mismatch of what's what's observed in the literature or what's recommended in the literature. Yeah, um, yeah that's pretty much it. And I think speaking on the media side as well, there's the, the idea that Michael Phelps consumes sort of twelve thousand calories a day, which is, is in my opinion, a, yeah, a nonsense. It's you'd have to be burning a thousand calories per hour for for ten hours to even come close to needing that energy requirement in a given day, which is is, is not going to happen. No. Um, in reality, they probably need about maybe four to five thousand of the training, sort of three hours a day. So um, it's not it's it's far below what people think they, they consume yeah exactly like i've seen a couple of uh, overviews on um, energy requirements and swimming is not the sport that comes up really high on that list you'll probably you'll see more of tour de france competitors you'll see um, ultra marathon you'll see um, iron man competitors and those energy requirements on competition days uh, I've seen some numbers close to 12, 13,000 on, on them. But like you said, those, like for example, running an Ironman or competing in an Ironman, you yeah. probably aren't just uh, exercising for three hours. It's, uh, it's a lot yeah. more than that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all day for most people. Yeah, you're yeah. talking at least sort of 12 hours for uh, the average person. I can't, can't recall what the sort of world record is. In the, the, but yeah, you, you sort of... You go in a, a bloody long time, and I think uh, another misconception as well is, is on the on the research side of things is carbohydrate loading. It's it's still sort of ingrained in most people's minds that you need sort of like a. So it's Bergstrom in '67 that came up with the the idea of carbohydrate loading, and you could sort of store above and beyond what you your glycogen stores are apparently capable of doing. Um, but say so recent research as well that shows that you probably only need a a single day, maybe two at most, to completely fill up your, your glycogen levels, which is it's obviously good news to sort of like game players and so on. So a soccer player that's got a got a match at the weekend and they've been training all week, they, they haven't got time to sort of deplete and then sort of refeed and, and that affecting the yeah. other training and so on. So it's it's a lot more practical and, and the sort of recommended amount is probably around ten grams per kilo that you can get a full uh, restoration of muscle glycogen, providing that you are uh, minimizing training for that day which which it would be before a game anyway yeah exactly and and like you said i think like the the recommendations that's come out uh recently uh, the last couple of years is clearly showing that you don't really need to push it for two days that's like it's been the practice uh, previously yeah carbohydrate uh, loading for two days yeah, um, or even sort of three to five days. I think it was the original sort of recommendations around sort of seven to ten grams per kilo. Yeah. So there'd be initial couple of days of glycogen depletion and then a sort of reloading phase. But um, that study that I mentioned, the one by um, Basso in 2002, they extended their, that refeeding for three days, and then three days didn't produce uh, any significant, significantly higher. Um, rate of restoration and, and muscle glycogen it was sort of maxed out at the one day yeah. point so um yeah one day would be would be more than fine for most people maybe if you're running a marathon maybe split that among two but maybe go sort of seven grams per kilo if, if, if you can't manage the full 10 but um yeah it's sort of reassuring for many to know that they can get a full replenishment in a, a single day a single 24 hour period yeah and i think uh, like I think it also depends on what types of sports you do because like I, I've seen people before before competition day they'll do two days of carb loading and they'll use the maximum amount that's required like yeah. 10 to 12 grams of carb per kilogram of body weight and uh, that can be a hassle uh, on those days especially yeah. considering GI discomfort uh, and that's something you probably don't want to drag into a competition day as well. Yeah, you, you don't really want to 
yeah, continue doing something that's a, a pain for, for more than you have to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, trying to eat 12 grams per kilo for two days is a, is a big ask. One day is challenging enough, but trying to do that back to back, yeah, there's not many that could, could stomach that. And the ones that could, yeah, you'd end up just feeling ridiculously bloated. You'd be on the toilet more or less constantly. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and that additional energy is just essentially going towards fat storage anyway. So it's not going to be a big deal because it's only an additional day, but um, at the same time, it's not providing any any benefit. Exactly. And like you said as well, if you're if you're continuing that sort of, if you are getting sort of GI discomfort as well, there's a possibility that that can carry over to competition as well. So yeah. it's probably worth doing the minimal effective dose, like like with anything in sports nutrition. Exactly. So if you were to give some, uh, like if you were to, because obviously different sports have different carbohydrate uh, requirements um, and recommendations. Uh, could you give us a couple of examples what the general rec- uh, recommendations are for some some different sports? Yeah, so um, for endurance, when they say you get someone performing so 70 to 100 miles a week, which is consistent with what? most elite guys would be doing uh, before like sort of 5, 10k and, and up to a marathon and, and so on then maybe about 5 to 8 grams per kilo per day of carbohydrate um, for someone in the gym it, it's it's a difficult one to estimate because people have got different training philosophies, if you're doing a lot of volume and a lot of frequency training a lot of muscle groups per week then um, or the same muscle group multiple times per week then you are going to burn through a lot more carbohydrate than say if you did sort of like a, a high intensity training where you'd be you'd be lucky to burn through a couple hundred calories in a given session. So you're not the additional carbohydrate demand isn't isn't that much at all. Um, so what I do then is I'd work out for for strength training. I'd work out their total daily energy expenditure, um, factor protein and fat and then just let carbs fall as they may so um, th- that probably end up between about three and five grams per kilo and for, uh, for most most people training so like a three to five days per week yeah. um, and for sprinters um, so I, I work primarily with sprinters in British athletics and th- th- again it depends on the coach's training philosophy some guys would only would, would do minimal training so they get down to the track so they'd say they do three hours training per day um, but they get down to the track, they probably have a chat for 30 minutes, do a warm up for 30 to 45 minutes, um, do a few strides, a few starts, um, just a few other drills as well, which are pretty, um, the more skill based, so they aren't, they aren't that demanding in terms of um, the energy metabolism. And then they'd probably go in the weight room to do like a 45 minute session, but that session would be probably three or four sets of cleans. Um, maybe some specific isolation drills if they if they need it if they're rehabbing and so on. So the overall calorie burn in that three hours is isn't isn't that much at all. So you'd be you'd be lucky to require an extra 150 grams per day with that. Um, whereas if you if you look if you take the the recommendations on face value in the literature, then you'd be recommending sort of five to seven grams per kilo. Where in reality, it's probably more consistent with a someone who's training in a gym. It's your three to five grams per kilo. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so. that's a great point, especially since if you just look, if you just base the recommendations based on the duration of the exercise you're doing, it would, for example, be misleading for a for a power lifter that might spend yeah. like two two and a half hours in the gym, but like most of the time is is resting between sets. Yeah, and it's it's difficult in that instance to get an idea of total calorie demand because you you ask most people how how much they train in a given week. They give you that time in hours, and mm-hmm. um, when I do these questions now, I um, I phrase it in how many hours of sort of low intensity, sort of skill based stuff, how many hours of medium intensity, and then high intensity, and you get you can get a better picture in in, in that regard and come up with a much more accurate way of determining expenditure, and, and just. As well, if you're working in a in a given sport, you see what training they're doing anyway, so you've got a good idea of what their energy requirements is going to be roughly. And then, like with everything, you end up tweaking it then based on what you see in see in reality. So body comp changes, um, the performance quality. So if they're feeling a bit flat and 
yeah, you'll probably need a bit more, a bit more carbohydrate and, and so on. So, um, yeah, I think the recommendations only go so far. I think it takes a, it takes the, the coach's eye to sort of see and, and assess where that needs to be. Mm-hmm. Exactly. One, one, um, one other uh, misconception when it comes to carbohydrates for performance <clears throat> and athletes is that it's a one size fits all shotgun approach where you try to shove as much carbohydrate as you can to to form perform the best but but uh, there has been some changes the last couple of years where you see that people are more talking about carbohydrate periodization during yeah. the week could you explain a bit more about that yes yeah, so i think uh, that there's a good paper actually from um aska you can drop i think is at birmingham um the paper's called the step to Towards personalized nutrition or something like that, and, yeah. and he sort of he takes those original recommendations and sort of makes the argument that yeah that we've just discussed now that this should be based on on the individual and how much activity they actually can actually uh, partake in rather than um, a sort of generalized idea based on yeah like the, I think it was a Louise Burke two thousand and one paper which at its time was great that was the the, the general recommendations and. And people then they use that, and then they only ended up tweaking it in reality anyway. So I don't think that the end result differs that much. Um, but yeah, and, and it's you mentioned the carbohydrate periodization as well, and I think that's yeah, definitely in the past ten years that's become a, a hot topic in, in sports nutrition. And it was there's a paper in I think 2004 which suggested the idea that reducing carbohydrate availability during training can um, help with adaptations and then in 2005 that's when the research really began with that um, we can get into the sort of mechanistic stuff later but essentially yeah what you do in that instance is um, so the idea that you reduce muscle glycogen um, and training with that reduced glycogen would improve adaptations uh, mainly mitochondrial biogenesis and then in, in order to get that what you'd need to do is basically not refeed for a given training session or maybe have a light breakfast and to not deliberately not fuel that workout as well and then perform that workout with yeah, reduced glycogen stores and because you're training a lot anyway mm-hmm. because this is designed for endurance athletes they'd be depleting their glycogen quite regularly anyway so you can just it's mainly a manipulation of just reducing carbohydrate intake for a given time point and there's various ways you can do that there's the the idea of um so train low, um, the idea of sleeping low. So after a training session, you depleted sleeping with those depleted stores and waking up and performing a, a fasted session or just protein. Um, yeah, just protein. And then at the same time as that, um, to avoid sort of to minimize hunger and stuff, you can compensate those those calories taken away with carbohydrate, replace those with, with fat. So um at least you are maintaining the, the energy intake and that energy availability somewhat. Excellent. Um, you, you you mentioned this with train low, sleep low. How would you like, for example, if you take an uh, example of one of the athletes you have worked with, how would you adjust the carbohydrate uh, intake during a week based on the intensities they have on each session? Because uh, uh, is it, for example, recommended that you do these low approaches on days where you have really high intensity or is it more recommended to do it on uh, low to moderate intensity days yeah it's it's advice really for for moderate intensity days because one of the drawbacks of depleting glycogen is that training intensity will suffer um, and given for a given training intensity as well your uh, rating of perceived reservation your rp will will increase um, alongside that so and it, it's something a lot of people that one of the misconceptions about training low is that yeah, you should do it all the time and then only sort of refill when it comes to to competing whereas um, the likes of James Morton and um, I think it's John Hawley um, and Louise Burke sort of I think she did a review in 2011 on it as well it's it's mainly sort of a couple of sessions a week um, and, and no real more than that. And like I said, it's usually around the sort of medium intensity sessions. So what you'd do the day before that is um, you'd minimize the carbohydrate consumption on the morning of training. You'd minimize that. 
And what you can do as well, because a lot of endurance athletes train twice per day, is after the first session in a day, um, not not deliberately not refuel. Um, so you're coming into the second session uh, with yeah more or less depleted glycogen, and then you're getting the that perceived or that potential enhanced response with that with that second session of the day. Excellent. I have a follow up question on um, more more of the mechanistic stuff that are really interesting with with these uh, with these protocols, but. Um, one one question that I also wanted to ask is, what are other benefits besides that to periodize your carbohydrates during the week? What can be beneficial for an athlete to do it that way? Um, in terms of psychology, main uh, probably getting a, a break from not shoveling tons of carbohydrate um, down the throats every day, and and maybe sort of have a lower carb and higher fat day one day and. Uh, it sort of breaks up that monotony a little bit. Um, potentially, if some people experience GI issues as well with with high carb diets day in day out, then you sort of minimise that those stresses on a couple of days per week. But in terms of a performance benefit beyond the sort of potential benefits of training low, uh, which we'll we'll discuss we'll discuss um, in a bit as well in, in terms of the actual research and what's that shown. I don't think there's any any benefit beyond that. Excellent. What about weight management? Do you think it will be would be beneficial for that as well in some sports? Um, yeah, actually, yeah. That, that you say, I think potentially with weight making sports, say, say a boxer, for instance, if they have to lose in the final week, say three kilograms to to meet their to meet their target weight, then to to lose that amount from fat would be difficult. So the, the most uh, the most logical. Like, um, approach would be to minimize or reduce muscle glycogen um, and then you'd get that reduction in, in muscle water as well so for every gram of carbohydrate stored requires I think between 2.5 and some data that we'll discuss in before and it suggests it might be even as high as 4 grams of water per um, per gram of carbohydrate stored which say you deplete in the region of sort of four or 500 grams um, then yeah, you're looking at a, a two to two point five kilo weight loss, which pretty much meets that. And then just some slight dehydration as well would get them, um, get them right on the scales. And then if you, especially with, it depends on the the actual time period between the weighing and and then the, the competing. But a lot of boxers, it's at least twenty four to thirty six hours before the before the fight after the weighing. So that's plenty of time to sort of refuel their muscle glycogen stores, rehydrate, and so on without affecting performance negatively unless you're a jockey <laughs> yeah yeah the jockeys have got it bad they probably have to stay well they have to have to stay at the, the reduced weight whilst they're on the horse as well so when they're actually competing and exerting energy which is is that little bit more difficult yeah you basically have to do it's like a constant depletion where you can't replenish anything unless uh, unlike the other sports where you actually have the ability to make weight and then replenish water and uh, carbohydrates afterwards. Yeah, definitely. It's um, yeah, I've heard of one or two horror stories about what jockeys actually consume and um, stuff like less than 500 calories per day, approaching races and so on. And yeah, um, yeah just the drinking coffee and having protein shakes or, or just toast. And it's yeah, it's, it's not much at all. And you, you, and the, the work that Graham Close is doing as well, and you, you discussed it briefly beforehand, and, um, and yeah, you, you can understand why the, their bone health suffers, their immune function suffers, and yeah, and the, the yeah, the essentially emaciated the, uh, most of the time, and their minimal muscle mass, and yeah, the, the, that's that's part and parcel of the sport. They've got to weigh as little as they can to to maximize the efficiency of the of the horse who's racing. So yeah, um, I it's, think it's. It's especially problematic that you are competing in a sport where you have to do follow a diet that are detrimental to your bone health and at the same time you're at a very high risk of fractures because of the risk of falling from the horse as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a double-edged sword in a way, isn't it? It's, but yeah, and unless there was some sort of regulations enforced by 
I don't know the governing body is around sort of jockeying um, if they've got one, but yeah, sort of minimum BMIs and things like that. I think would go a long way to improving overall health and and then the athlete. Um, but like with any sport, there's often a trade off between health and performance. If you look at um, look at a lot of runners, soccer players, when they retire, they've got basically knackered knees and, and ankles and so on. And um, but yeah, if you're paying me sort of 50 million quid a year i don't mind having knee replacements at, at 40 so <laughs> yeah exactly that's uh that's uh you take care of that later when you retire and yeah you, yeah so exactly yeah and and a lot of athletes accept that risk as well and i think there's a i can't remember where i read it initially but there's a question posed to a bunch of olympians um and they said something like if, if you could be guaranteed gold would you sort of die at the age of like 40 or something and yeah pretty much all of them said yeah because their goal is purely set on on that goal they don't care about the health the long-term health and the same with bodybuilders as well if, if you look at um the amount of steroids and, and stuff and the, the amount of food that they're eating day in day out and and yeah all the different hormones that they're injecting it's it, it, yeah it's obviously not good for, for heart health and, and cardiovascular health in general so it's but it's uh it's it's a trade off that they're that they're willing to accept. Yeah, exactly. I actually think uh, my one of my professors on the IOC program, Ron Mon, discussed this when we were talking about um, drugs in sports. That yeah. a lot of athletes are willing to die in the next years if it would guarantee them winning the gold medal in the Olympics. So that's how that's how dedicated some people. Yeah some people are and that's it's actually scary to, to think about yeah. and yeah Rio was only a, a week or so back and you could you could see it in the athletes faces and stuff when they missed out on a medal or, or they didn't or say someone a hurdler fell or something like that it's to them it's like four years of their life wasted and, and many of them wouldn't get that chance again and it's yeah it just shows you what's at stake for, for, for those guys and I think in reality there's there's a lot more to life than and competing in the Olympics, and I think that's a, a more of a first world problem. Yeah. Um, but in, in that athlete's mindset, they are they are a different breed in terms of the way they think and the motivations and so on. And yeah, they they don't care if they're putting themselves through any potential harm as as long as they're as long as they're performing as best they can. Yeah, exactly. So um, you mentioned a bit about the the fun stuff, the mechanistic stuff that happens with. Uh, with uh, having lower carbohydrate um, availability on some days, could you could you explain how pe- how we got interested in this and uh, what has the research actually shown? Yeah, so the I'll explain this sort of the, the proposed rationale uh, first of all. So yeah, like like we discussed earlier, training with limited glycogen availability uh, basically increases the the activity of a number of um, cell signaling pathways so um, the, the key kinases are like AMPK, um, P38, MAPK and, and then the sort of um, the scrap transcription factors like P53 and then the, the tr- transcription or coactivators like um, PGC1 alpha and what these do is have a knock-on effect uh, with the endpoint being a, an upregulation of the, the nuclear and, and mitochondrial uh, genomes which essentially the, the key the key aspect of this is an increase in my, mitochondrial mass and mitochondrial biogenesis, and yeah. So, to, to summarise that in, a, in one in one sentence, would be that training with limited glycogen increases um, one of the no, no and probably the most important um, adaptive component um, of muscle uh, for endurance athletes. Um, what the research has shown, though, is despite those these adaptations, there's not been a single study that's, to my knowledge, and this is probably talking up to about 2015, there might be some recent research that's come out to, to disprove what I'm saying, but there's no research to show a performance a benefit from from these uh, these practices. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult one to, um, it's a difficult one to me to, to recommend to athletes at the minute. And there's, there's a few other considerations as well. So like we discussed previously, the negative impact on training quality um, so performance can be performance can be rescued to a degree of the likes of caffeine and, and so on. So caffeine ingestion, whilst 
um, being glycogen depleted can um, improve performance to a degree, but not to the same extent as if you were performing with sufficient glycogen and not consuming caffeine. Um, so there is an overall reduction in, in effort. Um, the, the aspect of sleeping low as well, so sleeping with limited glycogen availability and not having that recovery process in place after a workout um, might hinder sleep quality in some athletes. I'm speaking mainly anecdotally on this, but I'm I'm sure there's some research to back back what I'm saying up. Um, there's also effects on potential effects on immune function. So that's one of the reasons why you'd limit it to sort of once to twice per week because if you're sort of doing it three or four times a week, there's that knock-on effect of that suppression in immune function. And um, Gleason wrote a good review on this in 2015. I can send you that and that, that you can put on in the notes if people want to look at that. And it discusses some of those these concerns about the, the training low. And I, th I think as well, some of the practical considerations are that most athletes, and probably one of the reasons why, at least in people who are better trained, because some of the research, especially the early research, is done on people who aren't, aren't well trained. Uh, but for those who are trained, there's not many athletes who perform every session. Well, there's, I, haven't, I haven't met a single athlete who's performed every session and with completely filled up glycogen stores. So if people are training twice per day, which most elite athletes will be, their second session of the day will be almost always be completed with a uh, reduction in muscle glycogen stores. So they're getting some of these benefits by default. So then trying to identify these in studies where a, a potential other limitation is you're assessing these in studies where the um, the measurement error or the, the accepted significance is... Um, larger than any performance. So a performance benefit of 1% would be massive in, in the real world. That would separate the top three or four finishers in most Olympic finals. But if you measure that in a lab and you're getting maybe a 1% increase and you might only get that in a handful of subjects, then that isn't going to reach statistical significance. So it might be due to, to measurement errors as well and the sort of application of that into a, a practical sense. Um, one of the things that, that I found as well is that it's difficult to convince a coach to do something uh, that's going to make their athlete perform worse in a training session, especially when you haven't got the research there to, to say that you're going to get a performance benefit from it. Because all a coach will say, oh, well, that's just you know, mechanistic bollocks. It's not going to, well, show me a study where they actually improve performance. And because there isn't one, then unless a coach is really... Um, willing to try things out, which most aren't because most would rather play it safe than to try something and that sort of regress the athlete. Um, it's difficult to convince a coach to do that. Um, yeah, because of the essentially the knock-on effect of the, the perceived training quality as well. Um, and it also might be the case that be, because an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis is such a small part of the picture in terms of overall performance and, and adaptation um, then it, it's likely that even if you do boost that significantly in, in, in looking at these these biological assays and so on that that doesn't necessarily translate in the real world and probably because of the the reduction in performance and stuff that it does does bring about um, because there was one study um, where they Matched. Um, I think this was 2005. I forget the author's name, but this was the first the first main study on on the notion. So what they did was they did a leg kicking exercise. Um, I think it was five days per week, and one group did it every day, whereas one group did it twice per day. So the second session they commenced with low glycogen levels, but the for, for the for the group that did it every day, so they were having near enough full glycogen availability on every session. Their workload was clamped at the equivalent of what the, the group could perform in a low group. Whereas in reality, the, the high group would perform a lot more because they've got sufficient glycogen. Uh, but then the authors did find that, yeah, there was a increased adaptation and um, increased muscular adaptations, and that had a, a knock-on effect then. I think, it was too, I think it was time to exhaustion. So the people who train their leg twice per day, then they were allowed to refuel and they, they performed better. Um, but that was only because intensities were matched. In other words, the intensity of the, the high-carb group every day was suppressed. So 
but in reality you aren't getting that you aren't getting that suppression of intensity you're going to be training at a considerably higher intensity with the the presence of glycogen uh, or sufficient glycogen so um it, it's almost like it cancels itself out that's what we've seen in the research at the minute um yeah and it'd be interesting to see how this sort of pans out over the next sort of three to five years and especially with the likes of um, James Morton doing a lot a lot of stuff on it at the minute yeah I think I think one of the problems is like you said that sometimes performance can be can be difficult to to measure in a lab setting as well that's one yeah. thing and that it can be also challenging to reach a statistical significance because if you look at like I often look at a paper and I'll see if they have the individual data points, I'll see, for example, two or three outlayers. That paper might be appropriate to use on, for example, an athlete, because usually yeah. they, those are the type that usually are the outlayers in uh, yeah. in the studies. Um, so yeah, that's that's my my view of it. Why we haven't probably seen any uh, benefits from these adaptations, and like you said, I can understand why some coaches might be inclined to use these protocols if it might um, reduce the athlete's performance since we still haven't seen any benefits uh, benefits from yeah. it yet yeah and uh, just as a an aside to that i think one of the potential benefits would be um so similar to strength training that you've got the occlusion so you can train at a relatively um lower intensity but still get the same metabolic stress and it's similar to to this training as well so if you if we know that if you can get the same um performance outcome whilst training low um and then obviously with a compromised intensity for someone who's recovering from injury where you can where that intensity is sort of um what they're capable of doing then you could argue that that would be potentially beneficial in that regard but for someone who's in full training and in the swing of things then for me it, for me it's not a plausible um practice at the minute i think it's as you know working working with athletes there's they're just like the general population really in terms of how they how they approach their nutrition sometimes often worse because they've always relied on their genetic superiority to sort yeah. of get them through so i think first and foremost we should be maximizing their their current nutrition before focusing on sort of theoretical principles that actually don't pan out as yet in, in the research so, yeah. um, and and even if they did do athletes are doing doing that anyway mm -hmm. by tra if they're training twice a day so um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting topic and it's 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 massively convoluted especially when you you look at the what what athletes are doing in the so um, so to to wrap this up um, there seems to be a lot of interest in ketogenic diets among uh, among athletes uh, are has there been any studies that actually show any benefits to using a ketogenic diet compared to a carbohydrate diet? Um, I'd say on on the whole, um, no. But um, if you look at some of the individual data, so there's I think it's the the Volex study. I think it was two thousand and one. Showed that there was some individual that performed better with a. Um, a low carb diet, so like a high fat ketogenic type diet, mm -hmm. um, compared to the sort of the standard sort of carbohydrate recommendations that you'd get from the literature. But on the whole, I don't think that if if you're performing any any degree of high intensity or, or super maximal exercise in a given a given event, then being keto adapted is going to be um, disadvantageous to that to that performance outcome and Louise Burke um, she's the, the AAS uh, the Australian Institute of Sport wrote a review last year um, so the, there's, the original was written in 2005 so high fat diet so the final nail on the coffin or something like that and then this was the the nail on the coffin revisited and basically reached the same conclusions but obviously did so in, in review of, of the, the lot more recent research and yeah. and it, what, what it comes down to is that you can't physically provide energy quick, uh, quickly enough to cover um, the cost of anything that's of, of, of any high intensity. Um, so even stuff like a marathon, you've got 
it depends on how it's run. If we take the 10K, for instance, with Mo Farah when he won that at the, the Olympics, um, they basically run around at quite a sort of leisurely pace, at least in, in terms of their their capacities. And then it essentially comes down to the last 600 metres where they kick and they are actually going sort of balls to the wall. Um, and there's no way they could reach those intensities on a, on a ketogenic diet. And you could probably argue that they couldn't even reach those throughout the former um, 9,000 plus meters of, of that event as well. And I don't think there's any Olympic event where an athlete would benefit from a ketogenic diet. Um, yeah, with the exception of maybe race walking in terms of actual actual sports, obviously things like shooting and so on. That, yeah. You, yeah, it doesn't really matter too much what you eat as long as you you maintaining concentration and so on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and there's no athletes as well that have medaled and say track and field who consume a ketogenic diet, and that doesn't show evidence of the lack of effect. But if that was better than the sort of the standard higher carb intake, then you'd see a lot more athletes doing that. And at worst, it's going to be in fear, and at best, it's going to be as good as a high carb diet um, so I see no reason to do that for any competitive sports um, in terms of stuff like bodybuilding there's there's a lot of people now who are um, training sort of keto in the gym and stuff and I think I think you can you can get away with that because especially if you're performing sort of lower volume more high intensity stuff with longer rest periods and what you can do as well as a more targeted approach so Lyle wrote about this and there's, there's ketogenic diet I'm, I'm sure everyone's listening is, is, is already read that it's almost 20 years old so you can't have you can't have missed that one um yeah so consuming carbohydrates just specifically around the workout so i think his recommendations were consuming before but what i found that works for people who are um on a ketogenic diet during weight training is consuming something during the exercise bout and there's there's pretty much 100%, almost 100% chance that they are going to remain in ketosis with that because as you've sort of warmed up and you're exercising, any carbohydrate that you ingest is going to contribute towards the towards exercise and you're not going to be storing it in the in your liver as glycogen or it's not going to raise insulin to any any real degree. So given those two markers are going to be unaffected, then you'd, you'd remain in ketosis um, quite safely and whilst also providing a slight boost even if it's a metabolic advantage a metabolic uh, mechanism with the, the carbohydrate actually fueling the workout to a degree or even the neural aspect so there's a lot of work in endurance athletes performing exercise of high intensity less than an hour where they benefit from exogenous carbohydrate consumption uh, because of the effects on the sort of neural pathways because of the uh, the oral cavity detecting the, the carbohydrate and increases the sort of um, the motivation, the reward process of that um, of that exercise. And yeah, so similar to the sort of mouth rinse studies as well, you can get performance effect just by swilling and tasting the carbohydrate and then spitting it out. Although I'm not sure there's many gyms that allow you to do that and end up with Lucozade. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it sort of it fits with that mechanism. I've, I've seen sort of good results with that. Um, yeah, with clients, not personally, I've. I've tried to keto adapt once. I got about a week in and um, I started feeling like shit for a few days into it. And then by a week, I sort of gave up on it because I had a lot of deadlines and stuff to, and I couldn't, I couldn't brain for the, for the, for the life of me. So yeah. um, even with stuff like coffee to try to sort of increase the cognition and stuff, I was just, I was just gone. So yeah. um, it's not something that suits me, I think. And I think that's a, that's consistent with a lot of people. It's actually quite impractical for most to keep carbohydrate, say below 50 grams per day in order to remain in ketosis. Um, it, you're essentially eliminating all carbohydrate apart from the vegetables. So, um, yeah. it's it's as difficult i think uh i think the m biggest problem that i uh, that i see with the ketogenic diets is having such low carbohydrate amounts limits practically all fruits and it also limits a lot of vegetables that you can eat so you have to really yeah. be picky with what types of vegetables you're eating as yeah. well um so that's an issue but like you said there, there's if you look at some studies and look at the individual data points, you'll see that some are high responsors to a high fat diet and might have a benefit to it. But 
like the majority of studies that you that looks at performance at high intensities doesn't show that ketogenic diet has a performance benefit you it might not be it might not be detrimental to performance if you're performing at low to moderate intensity but as soon as it it's high intensity uh, you you quickly see that uh, carbohydrates are king yeah exactly and it's it's almost like a, a core analogy as well by being stuck in say third gear and you can't get out of and that's essentially your limit yeah. there's there's no fourth and no fifth to sort of tap into as, as you need it and and even yeah even in sort of long distance events athletes often need to tap into those higher gears to um, especially with pacing strategies because it isn't if it was a time trial then you could keep a pretty constant pace and you could maybe get by on a ketogenic diet but then races aren't run like that they're against opponents who have got pacing strategies and so on and essentially you've got to beat the guy next to you or else you, or else yeah. you don't win obviously yeah exactly but what if uh, but what if like if you look at the research on high fat diets you'll see that fat adaptations usually um, gets upregulated at five days you get fat adapted and you start um, increasing your fat oxidation what if you were to do a ketogenic diet on uh, on all days except the day before competition day and the day of the competition day would you potentially see any benefits from that um there's there's actually been some data on this and and they've shown that when people are fat adapted even with high carb days in an attempt to restore glycogen and then restore that ability to um to undergo glycolysis to produce that energy uh, it, it it doesn't seem to this doesn't seem to work and one of the reasons mainly is a, a sort of reduction or a downregulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase which um, inhibits um, glycolysis somewhat so the carbs that you are eating and the carbs that you've got stored you can't use them to the same degree and it's and it, it makes sense as well especially when you look at the research during exercise when you can train your gut to absorb more carbohydrate the more you ingest and carbohydrate is quite um, of the three macronutrients, that's probably the most flexible in terms of your body's ability to um, to shut off its usage and to to oxidize more. There's the flexibility there too, um, and that's one of the reasons why it's probably best to keep carbohydrates relatively high at most time points. Excellent. I think actually um, there's a section in the paper that you mentioned by Burke, the, uh, 2015, yeah. where it, where she actually says that. People have thought for many years that by doing, like the idea behind doing a ketogenic high fat diet for five days, then carb up might be glycogen sparing, but it seems yeah. to be glycogen impairing instead, since yeah. you can't really use the substance. So it seems to be that you have to make a choice either to use fats yeah. or to use carbohydrates. You can't yeah. have both. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. It's yeah, and that's a, a great great quote as well. Is that is that from Louise Burke? Yeah, I think I, I like if <laughs> if my uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's actually a, a quote from from her paper where she yeah. talks about this. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's it's yeah, you've essentially got to choose one one or the other, uh, with the exception of maybe some targeted sort of carbohydrate around the ketogenic diet. Um, yeah, you can't expect to maximize fat oxidation and then be able to um, break down and use carbohydrates as efficiently as if you were con consuming a high carb diet. It just doesn't doesn't work that way. Um, yeah, and the same and athletes as well, um, highly trained athletes who consume high carb diets, they do oxidize a, a fair amount of fat during intent. Uh, during work as well, primarily from intramuscular triglycerides, their ability to improve fat oxidation um, increases as their um, their endurance capacity increases, their training capacity. So um, that would be potentially glycogen sparing in itself. But I think the best way to spare glycogen and to maintain performance is to fuel during a workout. Yeah. Um, so fuel during a, a, a training session. Excellent. I think yeah, I should bring you back for another podcast where we can talk specifically about that topic because that's a that's a interesting topic to talk about carbohydrate consumption during exercise, especially with the, with the research looking at um, 
uh, different carbohydrate, different uh, sugars that uh, might be beneficial to consume in combination with each other. Yeah, no, that I'd, I'd love to come back. Yeah, that would be that would be brilliant to sort of Thank talk you. through my ideas on that. And yeah, it's like you said, there's a lot of work done, especially in the past sort of ten years, so, uh, looking at multiple transportable carbohydrates and yeah, the different absorption characteristics and and yeah, how they yeah can affect performance and so on. Yeah, so it's it's quite a lot to quite a lot to get through. So yeah, I'd be happy, more than happy to come back and, and talk through those. Excellent. All right, Joseph, thank you so much for taking the time to do this uh, podcast. I think we covered a lot on uh, on this topic. So um, before we sign off, could you please tell us where people can find uh, more information about you? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be to be on Jim. I was uh, yeah, privileged to be, to be asked you. to come on. Um, yeah, so you can find me at I do most of my updates on Facebook, so that is uh, facebook.com slash Joseph Agu Nutrition. Um, so J O S E P H A G U Nutrition. Um, my Twitter, I, I'm, the, the post on Facebook gets sent through to Twitter. I don't tweet independently of that, but that's um, just Twitter and then at Joseph Agu. And my website, um, where I'm going to be blogging a lot more um, now, is Elite Nutrition Coaching, all one word, dot com. Excellent. And uh, for people that are listening, I highly recommend you checking out uh, Joseph's Facebook page. He writes a lot of good Facebook posts that uh, uh, that uh, has gotten a lot of um, attention lately, and uh, rightfully so, because like like I told you before we started, I think a lot of the stuff that you've been writing about lately is um, is really good. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, Joseph. Once again, thank you so much, and I uh, wish you a pleasant day. Likewise, Jimmy. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.